live conference, the first React live conference in two years. That's amazing. So we're all here. Uh, let's kick it off. And we better do it quickly uh, because uh, GitHub Copilot is going to steal our job soon. OK. I'm Liad Yosef. I'm the chief front-end architect in Duda. And I'm a web enthusiast. In Duda, we have a platform for uh, web professionals. Uh, we, uh, we do. Uh, design, we, do, uh, uh, we have a, a product that allows web professionals to design websites easily, quickly, and you're more than welcome to check out our booth because we're hiring. But on my night time, on my free time, I'm also an analog astronaut for the Austrian Space Forum, which is pretty cool. I also give keynotes there. Probably here I'm talking about a React query on Mars or something like that. So let's switch it a little bit and let's move to dark mode. This is better. This talk is going to be a little bit space-themed. Uh, I hope it's OK. So in Duda, uh, we have guilds, and we have squads, and we have dogs, of course. And the job of our guilds in Duda, and most importantly, the front-end guild, is to provide the squad all of the tools and the guidelines that they need in order to build better products, in order to build them faster, in order to build them more correctly, and in time, we've developed it, and we perfected it, and we built a sort of a set of tools that we, um, that we tell our developers here, use these tools, and you don't have to worry, right? You can use these tools, you can build whatever you want, and you don't have to worry. And if you think about it, this is in a nutshell something similar to what Create React App is doing. Create React App. It's the easiest way to build React apps today, right? Uh, if we did this talk about three years ago, uh, we would have to have a whole, a whole other day just on how to wire everything in React. But today, Create React App gives us everything. But it hides a lot under the surface. Because whoever is using Create React App, whoever is using the tools that the guild is giving them, whoever is uh, doing it mindlessly, doesn't really know what happens uh, behind the surf below the surface. Because we abstract everything from ourselves, from our developers, and that's not where we want to be. We tend to say that uh, as a guild or as uh, senior developers, we try to show the happy path. The happy path is all the guidance that you need, all the guidance that the developer needs in order to do their job uh, to, um, to develop whatever they need in the quickest, in the most reliable way. But the good quote from uh, Tolkien says, um, if, you go out of the if you go out of the door, you won't know where, you, where you'll go. You won't know where the, where the road will take you. And by introducing this happy path, we actually limit our developers, especially the new ones, to explore, right? Because we give them the tools, but they feel afraid to even eject Create React App. They feel afraid to a little bit explore. We feel afraid to explore things that are not in our day-to-day -day stack. While building this talk, I understood that before we can talk about advanced concepts, we need to break the entrance barriers. There are a lot of entrance barriers, even today, even with the uh, plethora of uh, articles and tutorials, there are entrance barriers to fields that are not related to your day-to-day -day job. You can work three years in a company and then leave this company and don't know how to write CSS because you have all the components uh, ready in advance. So let's change it a little bit. Instead of advanced concept in React, let's talk about jumping boundaries above and beyond. Because the problem today, if we want to, uh, to learn something, is that mo most of the tutorials online look like that. Okay, how to draw an all, just draw two circles, and then the rest of the all. Uh, this is very helpful, of course, especially if you're new to, to development. And there's a, there's a famous quote by Abraham Lincoln, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six sharpening my axe, meaning that you have to dive deep on the things that you already know. But I think, and Rick agrees, that the universe is much more complicated than you think. Don't, don't fixate on the things that you know. Try to explore and try to break those barriers. So let's try and do a 20 minutes quick jump in and out trying to break those barriers, okay? So we want to learn something new. We want to learn something that is not related to our everyday uh, job. We um, go online and we try to binge everything we can about this topic. And that's the problem. When you try to binge, you find out JavaScript Weekly and JavaScript Weekly and JavaScript Weekly and CSS Weekly 
and Webtools Weekly, and you find so much content, so many articles, that you get lost. And since you work in remote, this is what you do. You sit and watch Netflix, and probably not Dana Brown of stock. So Netflix you want? We'll give you Netflix. Let's talk about the Netflix of the things that you don't know already, the Netflix of the barriers. This is the Netflix that we want, right? This is the Netflix where you, uh, you go and you read articles online, and you try to avoid the things that you already know, recommended for you, because everybody knows hooks by now. Everybody knows hooks. Your guild can teach you about hooks. And uh, try to divert from the horror shows, like the mayor of East, East US 1, and how I added logger. Don't go there. Um, but what we want to focus now is the middle, the middle row, the things that you might not know, the things that you have a barrier to get into. Because if I'm a new developer, and if I, if I have only one year of experience, I probably won't read about front-end architecture. I probably won't read about the server walls. I probably go and read about CSS Grid, because that's what I'm working with. OK, so let's do a quick eight minutes, five minutes, breaking the barrier on front-end architecture. Ready? Go. OK, so you've decided, you've decided to uh, solve the most uh, pressing problem in tech today, which is, of course, recruiting juniors to the Avengers, right? That's the most pressing problem. Um, whoever understood this reference, two points. So you go ahead and you reserve your domain name, which is avengers.com. It was pretty late when I thought about it. <laughs> avengers.com. And you do, of course, the NPX Create React app Avengers. And you have all the juniors that you want to recruit. And of course, they're from DC because you always recruit from the competing companies. And this is your code. This is how your code looks like. You just import all of them, and you throw them all into the same bundle. And of course, that's what happens. Okay, you get very poor performance on, uh, on Lighthouse. You get uh, very poor performance from, uh, uh, you get a bad look from your manager. And you don't really know what happened because you did everything correctly. You did everything correctly. So let's do a quick primer on how bundle works. Okay? We have an application that's importing a lot of things. Those things are importing their own things. We can't really send that to the browser. Well, there are browsers. Uh, browsers already support ES models, but we want to bundle them. So what do we do? We use the de facto standard today is Webpack. And of course, there are some contenders, but Webpack is the, the de facto standard today. And Webpack knows to take the, this application, creating a single bundle from the entire app's code. And how do, you, how do you do it with Webpack? You just point it to the entry point. You say, hey, this is where you start your bundle from. This is the configuration of Webpack. It's, it's pretty easy. This is where you start your bundle from. And how it works, it just parses the entire dependency tree of whatever import it sees. So it goes import after import after import after import after import, after import and bundles everything to a nice file that you can now give to your browser. And of course, this is what happens. Because unless told otherwise, Webpack will try to bundle everything to the same file. What we can do is introduce code split or split points. Uh, we can just have dynamic imports, like you see here in the third line. And this import, this line, just basically tells Webpack, hey, do a split point here. Don't bundle everything to the same code. Uh, we can take it even uh, higher and, and build some sort of a router around it and have dynamic uh, imports in the, in the router. And that will split us into, uh, into chunks. But what are, what are we going to do with React? React is expecting not async code, but sync code, right? Because React, when it's parsing the component tree, it's parsing it synchronously. So uh, in React 16, we, uh, we were introduced with the uh, suspense and lazy. And just a really quick primer, lazy is our way of telling React, hey, this import is dynamic. So don't wait for it. Just render whatever you can. And when you get this import, we'll render it in, uh, in, in the place. Uh, but React also needs to know what to render until this code arrives. So for this, we have Suspense. And Suspense basically tells React, hey, uh, we have, for example, Earth, which I want to render synchronously. We have Mars that I want to render only if Elon Musk is present. And until Elon Musk arrives, just show a spinner. So it would look like that. And when we'll have the code of Elon Musk, we'll have Mars. And this is awesome. We can also take Suspense and uh, uh, give it a, a higher, uh, put it higher in the, in the hierarchy. And then we'll have a spinner for both of them. And when Mars arrives, we'll have Earth. Uh, when Elon Musk arrives, we have Earth and Mars. And you're probably asking yourself, OK, that's it? Just a glorified spinner. That's what suspense is? Well, yes and no. Um, 
In React, we have what's called Concurrent React, which is uh, pretty awesome, and we're going to have a talk today about it. Concurrent React was introduced uh, two years ago. It's about working on multiple tasks, and Suspense is a core feature with doing that. Um, actually, React 18 is introducing strat start transition, which is very, very interesting. You can actually tell React, hey, this action that I'm doing, it's not that important. So while you're doing it, you can render everything. You can uh, you can give uh, you can release the thread and let, for example, animations or user input uh, be processed, uh, and then just do your non-urgent action. Again, we'll have a talk later today. So go back to dynamic chunks. So the benefits of what we're doing when we're splitting into dynamic chunks is that we have a single entry point, and we don't need to orchestrate because Webpack takes care of everything. But the gotcha is that we have very little influ influence on the chunking and, and on how our application behaves. OK, so we go one step further. We're doing multiple entry points instead of chunking it into small chunks, we're telling Webpack, hey, you have several entry points, so just go to those entry points and create different bundles from each of them. But the problem is that Webpack is still sharing our chunks. It's still sharing our dependencies. So this is how it looks like. Those entry points and all of their imports will create those bundles. So now we gained a little bit control of our bundles, but there's a problem. We still need to orchestrate them. Since Webpack is not the one doing the orchestration, we're the one that needs to decide where every bundler is going to. So this is, could be a problem. Uh, we can go even one step further and do multiple bundles. Multiple bundles is basically telling Webpack, instead of having multiple entry points, we'll run multiple processes of Webpack. And that way, you, you can notice that the dependencies are not shared, but they are duplicated. And this is a very important thing to remember. That way, we achieve full isolation. We have the code which is fully isolated. We have the full control on the overbuild. Uh, we can use the same repo and same uh, packages. And we, have we can have incremental deploys. We can fire Webpack only if something changed in that part of the code that we're building, but we're losing because we, ha we have code duplication and we need to orchestrate. Orchestration is something that you can do manually. You can just, what we do, for example, is uh, we define uh, here uh, AMD require that whenever our chunk of the code needs some sort, uh, some uh, module. It just tells, hey, get module async, for example, editor. And then what, whatever it does, it just goes to where the editor chunk is placed, bringing it back asynchronously, and then you can use it. OK. Uh, you have to enforce separation if you want, uh, if you want to do uh, incremental builds. You can do it with, uh, with ESLint. Uh, this, is a, this is a very uh, common way to do it. OK, let's talk a little bit about code duplication. So, Let's say we have all of those Marvel characters, and we want to bundle the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and WandaVision. The problem is the Avengers have Thor. Guardians of the Galaxy also have Thor. And WandaVision has Wanda and Vision, which are also part of the Avengers. So we have common dependencies here, and if we try to bundle them, we'll have a lot of duplication. So one tool in order to avoid that is just to define externals, right? We can tell Webpack, hey, don't bundle Thor in any of the bundles. We will provide it. We'll provide Tor, so just bundle the rest, and we'll provide Tor, but it's our responsibility to provide the externals. OK, a little bit about micro frontends. Micro frontends is like the next level that we can take here, is uh, to assemble an app from independent parts, not unlike the, uh, the International Space Station. It basically, says, it basically tells that when we look at the screen, when we look at the application, we, don't, we, we can't really know uh, for each part how it was built. So we can just assemble in the same window parts that are being built or deployed in different places. We can just break it into parts, have different teams working on each part. Every team can work in the same, in their own repo. They can work in their own um, technology. And we can just later just assemble it and put them in the, same, uh, in the same window. So we have separate builds and deploys, which is pretty good because we achieve full autonomy. But now we really, really have to orchestrate. That's the problem. We have to make sure that we know what to load when. And we have to make sure that we load the correct versions of, of everything. And we have to control the dependency management. So it can look like that. It can be a, a pretty mess when you work with micro front end. You have to do it correctly. And Gil Tayar is going to have a great talk today about micro front ends and way to handle micro front ends. So basically, it all boils down to separation versus duplication. When we think about front-end architecture in the, in the code terms, we need to decide, do we want to separate our code? Do we want to separate 
our, uh, our efforts. Do we want to build separately, deploy separately, but then we have to manage the duplicate code, the duplication of code. This is what's different when you're working with front-end code as opposed to back-end code. In Webpack 5, Webpack uh, introduced model federation, which is pretty neat. Uh, just a few seconds on that. In, in uh, model federation, if you have two applications or two micro front that want to share code, one of them, uh, for example, app one wants to share the same button from app two, so it can just declare that one of its remotes is app two. App two can just declare that it exposes button for app one or for whoever, whoever wants, and then app one can just get the button from app two without Webpack having to bundle it in the same app. This is pretty awesome. If you let it sync, you understand what a, what a major change is that. Because we don't need to uh, manage dependencies anymore. Uh, so if we'll take this example for a pretty common app where you have three micro frontends that most of them require components, that those components require the React and React DOM, and micro frontends require React and React DOM as well, then instead of just bundling each of them and duplicate the, du duplicate the dependencies, uh, if we define them correctly, if we say that the component app exposes the components and its remote is, the, is React and the uh, lib app is uh, its remote, are, uh, sorry, the main app, its remote are lib app and component app, we can have just imports like that, static imports, and Webpack will take care of bundling everything where it needs to be. We can't talk really about front-end architecture without mentioning Vit. Uh, Vit is like the new kid in town. It's um, it's a rising competitor for Webpack and for this uh, concept of bundling things. Um, Vit uses ES modules, which means that you can now send to the browser models that are doing ES imports that uh, you can models that are importing other models. It makes the development much faster, the hot model reload much much quicker. And there's a great talk uh, by Benjamin Grunbaum. Uh, should we still be using Webpack in 2021? Spoiler: The answer is yes. But again, you should definitely check out Vit. I think that if I'd start a, a project now, it will be with, uh, with Vit. OK, that was six minutes. Breaking the barrier on front-end architecture, right? It wasn't that hard, because now you have the knowledge, you have the ability to dive deeper into, uh, into front-end architecture articles. You have now the ability to read tutorials or to watch tutorials and to take it one step further. Let's go into server wars. Are you ready? We're going to do breaking the barriers on server wars. So a little bit history about the server client wars. In classic server rendering, the server is generating all the markup uh, in, in the server, all the display markup, sending it to the client. And the client just asks for the interaction code in order to make this application something that we can interact with. PHP is something that you can uh, think about related to, to this practice, or JSP, or every other whole world that, uh, that you want to think of. And basically, it works like that. You have the server, and you have the client, and the client is asking the server to assemble the page for it. The server tries to assemble everything from the database, from, uh, from network requests. Everything is assembled into the page, and then it creates what is called just, just the markup, so like a, a flat markup and sending this to the client. And this is the, the flat markup. This is all that the client sees. But now it's not intera interactive. You can't do anything with it. Well, you can just watch it, because it's just presentational. But you can't really do anything with it. So the client basically tells the browser, OK, make those things useful. And, and the server is sending the JavaScript, the Mindstone, in order to make them useful. And this is basically how server rendering uh, works, classical server rendering. In client-side rendering, which is a practice that uh, uh, I think in the last 10 years we started more and more doing, is that we generate the display markup and the interaction logic in the client. Because as end devices become much stronger, and as network uh, uh, speeds become much faster, we can now send everything from the server to the client and have the client build everything. And this way we achieve uh, more complex apps, we achieve more uh, be better interactivity. This is what React does, basically, on the, on the client. How it looks, um, the client asks for the server, OK, assemble the Avengers. And the server just sends it an empty container. And then the browser has to ask, has to ask the uh, React code and the JavaScript code in order to build it on its own. So the server just sends React and JavaScript. And uh, React does render on the client. 
and then it builds everything. It has to what's called um, not just create the presentational markup, but also make it useful. And if you have the the, the benefit is that in that is that if we have one component that is missing, we can later ask the server to send that JavaScript, like we saw in lazy and uh, suspense, and then add this component, which is pretty cool. Now we have a new paradigm uh, in the past few years that's called server-side rendering. It means we're using React, but we're rendering it on the server. So the server generates the display markup, and the client just run interaction logic in the cloud. What? I mean, we've just come a full circle. We just come a full circle from PHP in 15 years ago to server-side re server rendering methods today. Because if the server now is generating our markup, and we can use React because React is, is just a templating language, so it doesn't matter. We can use it in the server. We've just come a complete full circle. And you might ask yourself, if you're new to the field, why? Why are we doing this? Well, um, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, SEO, for example, it's better because if the SEO, uh, if SEO engines get just the empty container, they don't really know what to deduce with, uh, from it. But if you build everything on the server and then send it, then you have better SEO. You have, of course, better accessibility. Um, you have better performance because the user sees everything the minute that it arrives. And there's a, a really good talk from each other. It says, uh, single page application ruined the web. Spoiler, no. But, uh, um, but again, server-side rendering is what I think the, um, uh, what you want to do today if you're building a new app. So it looks like that. In the server-side, you just um, render to string, right? You get the, the component tree. You render it to string. And on the client side, you have to do what's called hydration, which is I'm getting the markup, and then I have to make it interactive. Look at this line. It is synchronous. It is synchronous, and that's, that's going to be a problem. Because in the server, if I'm asking a page, the server cannot wait for, every, for everything to be loaded. It cannot wait for everything to be fetched, because then the client won't get anything. So in React 18, we're introduced with a new feature called Suspense SSR. You remember Suspense from the previous show that we saw? Because the problem in SSR is that you have to fetch everything in advance. You have to load all the JavaScript in the client before you can hydrate. And you have to hydrate everything before you can even make it interactive. So it's basically a waterfall, right? Fetch all data, render entire HTML, load entire J JavaScript code, and hydrate entire ha app, which is pretty slow and pretty cumbersome. So let's say that you want to continue your website from before, and you're adding a mentorship for the new Avengers recruiter. You call it, of course, mentors. And uh, um, the people that you recruit can select one of, uh, of each mentors. And this is the page that you want to, you want to show. You want to show the, um, the title of your mentor, and then the bio, and maybe reviews, and uh, the image of the, of the mentor. And it looks like that, right? You have the, uh, the name, the image, the description, the reviews. Everything is static. Everything is synchronous. Everything is OK. When you try to do server-side rendering for it, it will be OK, because the server just renders everything to the markup, right? everything to, to markup, sends it to the client. It's not interactive yet. It's just the markup. Sends it to the client. Then React will do its magic, and it will be hydrated and interactive in the client. This is awesome. But what will happen if we want to have our app a little bit more uh, lean or a little bit um, more dynamic? And we want the, the image and the reviews to be loaded dynamically in the client. Because maybe we need to fetch the reviews from database, or maybe we want to wait for the image component to arrive. In that case, in that case we'll have a problem. Because first of all, we need to wrap our reviews, for example, in suspense. You remember, we need to wrap it in suspense in order for React to know that it doesn't need to, to render it. But when we try to server-side render it, we have a problem because the server doesn't know what to do there. The server gets this suspense, and it says, OK, I, I don't know what to, what to return to the client. And this is a problem because the browser is just waiting and waiting and waiting, and it doesn't have anything. So that's a problem. You have to fetch everything in advance. And at that point, you're giving up. You're saying, OK, SSR is out. I don't want to, I don't want to do SSR. But you have suspense SSR. And Suspense SSR uh, uses two new features in React 18, which is streaming HTML. React DOM server now knows to stream HTML to the client. And you have selective hydration, which means that the client now knows to hydrate parts of the page selectively. It doesn't need to hydrate all at once, which is pretty awesome when you think of it. You need to change a little bit the API, because the React team 
decided to do it opt-in rather than opt-out. So instead of render to string and hydrate, you have to render to pipeable stream and hydrate root. But what we'll gain is that now this, this, mar uh, this uh, component will render into this markup and the server will put the spinner there. So the server will return to the browser the markup with the spinner, which is pretty awesome. And uh, it won't be interactive because React will need to hydrate everything. And then we'll have an interactive page on the client with a spinner. And only when the reviews will be ready, the server will send the partial HTML with a script that tells it, OK, replace the spinner with the comments. And then our website will be, uh, will be ready and will be fully interactive, which is pretty awesome. It doesn't stop there. You can also, uh, React in the client can also do this selective hydration, meaning that if we have this on the client, and the user clicks on the reviews, because it's not interactive, but he wants to click it, React will record this click and replay it when the reviews will, be, uh, will arrive. And it will know to hydrate them first. This is pretty amazing. Um, the next stage is, of course, React server component. We have a great talk about it today. Uh, React server component, just in a in few seconds, tells that if we have, for example, this page, and the only thing that needs to be, um, that needs to be dynamic here is the rating, because we just want we want the user to read everything, but we want it to interact with the rating. We don't need all of the um, uh, database calls and the and the bundling that arrives with the entire page. We can just define those parts as server components, and only the client, only the, the rating as client component. Sorry, as a client component, and that's the only thing that's going to be shipped in our bundle, which is pretty amazing. It can cut bundle sizes in 90%. Um, Again, uh, we have uh, Dana Abramov uh, gave a nice uh, demo about it, and we'll have a talk about it today. And again, we can't talk about the server client roles without mentioning Next. Next.js is probably going, to, probably solving all of the things that uh, that I I just uh, mentioned. Uh, Next.js allows you to opt in for server-side rendering by providing a function called get server-side props, which is what the prop that will be given to the component when it will be server-side rendered, and also can do static-side generation, meaning it can, during bundle time, pre-render the pages as static pages, which is pretty pretty amazing. This is what we need to do. And we can't talk about Next.js without mentioning Remix. Remix, that's the new kid in town. Um, that's something that gained a lot of popularity in the, in the past uh, few, few weeks. Uh, it was payment only. It, was, uh, like, uh, uh, it wasn't open source until a few weeks ago, and they open sourced it. And Remix is like, very slim Next.js. Uh, it, uh, it allows you, um, Ken C. Dodds is, uh, is the dev advocate for Remix, and I, I really advise you to, to see his talk about it. Uh, it, uses, it utilizes nested routing in order to fetch everything in advance, in order to know just from the URL what are the data and the components that they, that they need to send to the client in order, to do, uh, in order for the client to have a much better uh, response time. And it's pretty amazing. Remix is not using React server components. As a matter of fact, they just did a demo that showed that just Remix has better performance than React Server Component, which is pretty mind-blowing. Um, so again, I urge you, uh, there's a good React Server Component stock today, and check out Remix. And client and server, we don't, we don't have to fight, right? We can, be, uh, we can be friends again. And those were a few minutes about breaking the barrier in client-server client world. That was really easy just getting into this area. So if you didn't know anything about server-side rendering, now at least you have the, the basic knowledge in order to get into that. So now it's pretty late at night, and you say, OK, I probably need to get to sleep, but I, I'll see a few minutes from this new show that everyone is talking about, the metaverse. So you start to watch, and at first, uh, this is what you, you see. And you say, oh, wow, the metaverse is amazing. We'll have a uh, virtual shop. This is actually a true virtual H&M uh, shop going to be in the metaverse, which is amazing. And you say, OK, I want to get into that. I want to get into the metaverse. What does it mean? And you, can, you see this is, again, uh, Nike just purchased um, a completely virtual uh, shoe company that produces NFTs. Uh, you say, OK, I want to get into NFT. I want to get into Web3. It's pretty late at night, so I probably won't understand anything, but I still want to, to, uh, to see it. Um, so what is Web3? You start to read on Web3, and you see that Web3 is, wait, let me fire the suspicion matter first. Uh, let's see if it goes from round Earth to flat Earth. 
So Web3 is a, a decentralized and fair internet where users control their own data, identity, and destiny. Okay, this is uh, uh, a little bit too uh, um, Burning Man <laughs> for me. Uh, Elon Musk is not a big fan of Web3, and if you know Web3 only, uh, only by knowing the cryptocurrencies, you probably see, think, okay, I don't know how to get into it, but hear me out. Web3 is actually pretty awesome, and we're going to have a talk today about uh, programming in Web3. Web3 basically means uh, we have the uh, um, decentralized computing power, and we can just deploy programs or smart contracts uh, into, into this decentralized uh, chain. Um, and there's a good uh, tweet that says, if you know React, you can pick up Web3 in like a week, which is pretty true. Uh, this is going down the rabbit hole. You can run smart contracts stored on the distributed blockchain. And basically, smart contracts are just code. We see it's very similar to, to JavaScript. And the distributed blockchain that we mostly do is, uh, is Ethereum virtual machine. This is very exciting. You can write smart contracts in a language, for example, called Solidity, if you want to deploy it on the EVM, on the Ethereum virtual machine. And look how, how similar it is to JavaScript, right? It's pretty easy to pick it up. For example, this is just a smart contract that knows to create tasks, uh, to do tasks. You deploy it to distributed, uh, distributed um, uh, computing nodes. And you can do, uh, for example, even simpler smart contracts, just a getter and a, name, uh, and a setter for a name. You can use that to mint your own tokens. Mint your own tokens. This code will mint our React Next token, which is pretty amazing. This is all we need. This is all the code that we need that says, OK, if I want to send uh, tokens to someone and I have this amount, just abstract it for myself and add it to the sender. This is so simple. This is not like the Web3, the complex Web3 that we think about. This is really simple. And interacting with it using React or JavaScript is also uh, very easy. Uh, we have Ethers, which is uh, like the jQuery for using Web3 on the, on the client. And we have MetaMask, which is uh, our identity provider, uh, authentication provider. This is a, a, a web extension that you can, just, you can just install. And when you install it, you can use, you can write this code in the browser and you can just interact. Look how easy it is to interact with the contract that we just deployed. For example, the contract get name, that's the same get name that we just wrote. And again, we're going to have a talk about uh, Web3. Um, and Morales I.O. is like the Firebase of Web3, so I urge you to check this out. You go deeper into the rabbit hole and you think about 3D. Can we do 3D in React? And this is actually uh, a 3D generated video. This is not a real video. This is a video from, um, uh, from the new Metrics game built on Unreal Engine. Look how impressive it looks. And you say, OK, I want to do that. I want to do that. And then you read into the React tutorials, and you find out that you can do this. Um, but again, see how easy it is to do that. Look how easy it is to build. Well, it's just a cube bouncing up and down. But it's just like, I don't know, 15, 20 lines of code. Just doing it, you can use React 3 Fiber. And in a few minutes, you broke the barrier into using React in order to, to build 3D application. And you go even further and you say, OK, I want to build VR with React. And I want to build this. I want to build a competitor to Facebook uh, work, workrooms. And you start to do that. And you see that you have React 360, that you can build VR applications. And no. I mean, you need to know to stop at some point. You need to know to curate yourself. Because it's so easy to break those barriers but you need to know, you need to build your own path. You need to decide what to learn. So in the huge Netflix universe of things that you can learn, you can try to move away from what's recommended for you and maybe explore some things that are not related to your day-to-day -day job. But after everything is done, you can treat yourself with an episode of Hooks. You've earned it. It's easy. So build your own path. Build your own path, curate, curate yourself. You're very awesome. Thank you for listening to my talk. And thank you. <laughs>